Nissan Bulavanaka and g'day. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome to Sydney Ideas, the University of Sydney's flagship public talks program. I am Professor Chorchi Ravulo, Chair of Social Work and Policy Studies here at the university, as well as Adjunct Professor at the University of the South Pacific. I'm your host for tonight's event, Pacific Influence presented in collaboration with Commonwealth Studies Conferences Australia. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. The University of Sydney is on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to the Elders, past and present. I further acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country on which you are on today, where you live, work and share ideas and pay respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all First Nations people present today. Again, welcome and vanak vakalevu for joining us. We're so excited that you're here with us. Yay, round of applause for being here. <laughs> Now, there's much attention on the Pacific as leading world powers seek to have influence and possible control on the access and development in and across this particular region. The way in which this is occurring is shaped competing priorities and outcomes underpinned by economic and financial incentives. But despite this goodwill intention, a key question remains. What are we doing to genuinely and sustainably support Pacific peoples across the region? We have some great minds in the room to critically explore this overarching question. I'd like to invite you to come and take a seat. Dr. George Carter, Research Fellow in Geopolitics and Regionalism at the Department of Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. George, come and join us up the front. A round of applause for George. <laughs> Very respectful. George's research and teaching interests are informed by his education, work experience in the Pacific and upbringing through his proud Samoan, Tuvaluan, I Kiribati, Chinese and British ancestry. He serves his family and village in Samoa, where he holds the Matai chiefly title of Sala. Dr. Langi Poiva Sherelle Jackson from the islands of Savai'i in Samoa. Join me in welcoming her to the front. Sherelle has worked in the Pacific Islands as a journalist and scholar and specialises in the areas of climate change, environment, human rights, gender sensitive reporting and broader development issues. She serves on the board of the Oxford Climate Journalism Network and the Covering Climate Now initiative. She is Samoa's rep to the International Federation of Journalists Gender Council. Again, please welcome George and Langi. <laughs> okay, so the format of tonight's event is a panel discussion, but not as you know it. We're going to run it as a talanoa, which is a shared conversation where we can talk collegially, collectively and collaboratively amongst ourselves and also with yourselves as well. We are very much welcoming your questions. You can ask your questions at any time via slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O, and use the code SYDNEYIDEAS. For those <coughs> in the room, we have two roving microphones as well, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Now let's get started with the Talanoa. And I'd like to ask our panel to further reflect with me on our first introductory question, which really goes to the essence of what does it mean to be part of this region, especially as people that might be living in the diaspora here in Australia or New Zealand or in the United States. But what does it mean for us to have an influence? And what does that mean when it comes to shaping the political and even environmental but even broader socio-conversations around these particular areas. So the, the key question to start with is, who benefits from having influence and control across the region and why? Who would like to go first? 
sure how long. <laughs> <laughs> We're both Samoan, so we can do this all night long. <laughs> Well, I can go first since Salah has uh, given me the honors uh, and his title is a little bit higher than my title back at home, so I'll do the deuce. First of all, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land um, and say Tsalo Falava, uh, Tsalo Falava. And thank you so much to the University of Sydney for having us here. Thank you to Professor Georgie for having myself here. Thank you. Um, and it's also great to meet uh, my dear brother George here as well. So this question, I love this question because it can be viewed in two different ways. One is who benefits, as in who, as in um, which global north power or which developed country benefits from influence in the Pacific. The natural answer, of course, is China. Natural answer is USA. But I don't want to talk about the global north influence. What I really want, the way I want to answer that question is, those who truly benefit from influence in the Pacific are the indigenous peoples of the Pacific. Mm. The Samoans, the Tuvaluans, the Ikiribas, and so forth. Mm. We are the true owners of the lands and the oceans that our people occupy and have voyaged and occupied for years, our ancestors. So who benefits? We benefit. But that benefit can only be sustained and truly be recognized if it is recognized in governance structures, if it is recognized internationally. So we can, you know, we can say all we can about how beautiful it is to, to own our lands and our ocean spaces, but if it's not recognized within government policy, if it's not recognized within international negotiations, when if traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge continue to be ignored and sidelined, um, then that influence matters nothing. Langi, further to that, I actually wanted to just unpack something that sure. you just said, and then I will hand Thanks. it to, to Salah. What is stopping those particular Pacific perspectives, ways of knowing and doing, being and becoming, also known as epistemologies and ontologies. I always feel smart when I say those words. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is stopping those particular views and values, practices and perspectives from actually breaking through and actually influencing this shared conversation? Colonialism, right? A couple of white men, you know, um, came off a boat and decided that what they felt was right was what went. And so we discarded our values and our cultural and traditional knowledge that our ancestors handed down to us. And we took on Christianity that further suppressed a lot of our cultural practices and a lot of the knowledge and the practice that we had to maintain peace, that we had to sustain knowledge, that we had to like govern our villages and our, and our systems within districts. Um, we, we suspended all of those because we were told, you know, our leaders were killed in the process of trying to protect those very cultures. So that's what stops it. Okay. And it's not in my view, it's fact. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Salah. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, uh, the First Nation indigenous owners of this land and also First Nations who are in this room. I'd also like to say Talofa uh, from all of us to all our Pacific Islanders who are in the room, who are also listening online to this great presentation of Sydney Ideas. Hopefully this podcast or this video inspires more work from not only this university, but also in this country in terms of unpacking, understanding, and engaging with the Pacific. Um, so we came together to understand influence, and this is very much a big part of the research that I undertake in the area of international relations, diplomacy, influence, because we tend to think of it from, especially in my discipline, of power and control. Who has the power and who tends to control? And this has also shaped the way that I explored not only regionalism, but also how external players engage in the Pacific, but also how Pacific countries participate in climate change negotiations, which is a very dear part of, of my research. But over the years, influence is not, also, it's not just power, but it also runs parallel to something 
that I found that's much more deeper, which is relationality. And that's something that uh, we're learning much more as we engage in understanding non-Western powers. Last week, we had a great lecture at the ANU on Indigenous and First Nations international relations. Very similar to what we're unpacking in what we say is oceanic or Pacific diplomacy, is that this uh, influence is not just about power, but it's also about relationality. It's very understudied. You know, part of the second portion is why, why don't we know about this? Uh, how do we engage in this? So our universities are at fault, very understudied. Our students are not taught this in, in Samoa, in USP Fiji, in Australia. We don't give it that command. We don't give it that same level of uh, how we uh, sort of privilege Western knowledge. It's the same thing that Sherelle is uh, un, um, unpacking here is in terms of traditional and indigenous knowledge. And so that's part and parcel of where it's, um, why it's missing, uh, sort of understanding. And so when we are thinking and talking and trying to engage in what Pacific, what influence is, let's not just focus on control and power, but also broaden our visions and also our understanding into relationality, authority. And that's something that's embedded in a lot of our communities. And as our conversation will go along, I'll show you how that's unpacked now by governments in the Pacific, for regional organizations. And this is one of the great gifts that the Pacific has for the international society. Um, and that's, that's fascinating, this idea of relationality. You're talking about building and maintaining and sustaining relationships. Is that what's key and what is potentially missing in that broader influence piece by Pacific people for Pacific people? Um, I'll, and there are many ways uh, and sort of growing scholars who have looked at this. Um, some of the work that we're working on, really, we look to theology and we look to education. These are some great scholars from the Pacific, like um, Upolu Ba'ai, Kapini Sanga, um, um, and uh, many others. Rupurake. Rupurake. Uh, they've understood that the Pacific also uses relationality, which is, stems from indigenous knowledge um, and indigenous ways of knowing or worldviews in their engagement, and so they've mastered contextualizing these ideas into how it works with community. So where am I going with the question here? Relationality. 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 It's about bringing back that it's not just about the control or the use of resources, which tends to be where a lot of our um, mindsets or, or worldview tend to, but it's also about how human beings live at peace and in harmony with nature and brief resources, and the ideas around stewardship, that you are supposed to be caring for this environment and as you pass them along to the next generation. So it's, uh, in what they, as some would say, like Upolu I would say, it's a whole of life philosophy. We're hearing this from indigenous and First Nation scholars. They're saying this has always been part, it's always been, it's been here. Yet we haven't, within universities, uh, within our education systems, we haven't properly given the recognition and we haven't incorporated that into our thinking because it is part and parcel of something that's very important. Now, again, I'm a scholar that works around states' power and, uh, and I see this as a fundamental part of international relations. It's not just a fancy thing that happens locally here or in the islands here. I think it's something that's much more important uh, into international science. <coughs> yeah, fantastic. Georgie, if, yes. if I may add, because um, my brother here has touched on, on several aspects of um, perspectives in terms of viewing um, indigenous knowledge, recognition, and bringing these issues into scholarship internationally and Australia's recognition of that. I think what's important also, um, well, first of all, disclaimer, I'm a village professor, as in I grew up in Sava on the island of Savai. So my knowledge of and understanding of indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge 
um, is really based on that village life mm -hmm. and understanding it from, first of all, not understanding English, learning English, and then understanding how people and international community perceive us. I think it's important to note that when I do say indigenous knowledge, I mean from the ground, like the recognition of our own indigenous knowledge by indigenous people. Because this movement of um, getting recognition for ideas and traditional knowledge globally disregards the fact that the, this knowledge already existed mm -hmm. and were validated by our ancestors and our communities internally. So I think the bringing it to fore and bringing it through academic and through research is a second affirmation in, in a way. I just wanted to add that. No, I love that because I think generally when we look at the Australian way of looking at the Pacific, generally it has been quite paternalistic and yeah. we've been seen as the big brother or the uncle and that the islands need us as opposed to, no, the islands actually operated and existed with all of these perspectives prior to colonisation. And it is about then revaluing a lot of those key concepts, right? Especially around this notion of reciprocal living and this idea mm. of being able to live in the context of other people, not just ourselves. Yes. Yeah, okay. Which actually leads to the next question that I have, which is about accountability, especially when it comes to outside influence coming into the Pacific. What levels of accountability exists? <laughs> 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 Let's go to macro, <laughs> micro. And so, um, sorry, if we could just repeat the questions on account. Yeah, I think at times we look at the region, we generally go, well, it's all fair play, you know, this neoliberal, it's, you know, fair game for anyone to come in and play in the Pacific. But when they come into play in the Pacific, are people held accountable for the impact and or the influence that they may actually have in the region? Okay. Uh, thank you, Georgie, for that question. And... Um, I guess in one way to help um, answer this question is to also just have a look at the colonial legacy um, of external influence that this region, uh, ocean continent, has been always viewed uh, from the conquest of external players, European uh, and uh, uh, powers coming through for geopolitical conquest. We saw it in the times of the Spanish conquest in the 1500s, in the overtake of Guam. We saw this in terms of colonial administrations being established to look after um, adventurers who were coming towards the Pacific, beachcombers and traders. We saw the establishment in the 1700s and 1800s of colonies uh, through empire building. And we see the French, the United Kingdom, and the United States at that time setting up colonies. First World War, we then see a changing world. Uh, Australia becomes a colonial administrator of Nauru and Guam, and Japan becomes administrator of Northern Pacific. We tend to forget during this time, during these uh, conquests, there was a lot of extraction of minerals from the Pacific, copra uh, and from the agriculture, minerals from phosphate, the beginning of geological ex um, examinations, to explorations for oil and gold. And so the region was at that part, not only, I mean, part of geopolitical conquest uh, uh, by external play partners was to look for these resources, the plantation economies. And it brought along uh, adversaries that were created not by Pacific peoples, but people who were sitting at tables in Washington, in London, um, here very much in Canberra new um, um, sort of tensions that were not of their undertaking. World War II, we see um, the War of the Pacific, which then sees a new security theater and the Pacific recarved and uh, uh, with new lines of new uh, um, uh, partners now becoming, uh, you know, becoming colonial administrators. Decolonization, we then see communities, island communities, political communities now forged um, having to become independent nations. Cold War of the 19, uh, 1950s all the way to the 2000s sees these tensions play out between the Pacific, the West, and Russia. Again, now we see with the US and China fighting for primacy in this world, these conquests again are 
are replayed again in front of our, uh, in front of our um, handsets and our um, cell phones and the news that we get. So the region has always been, or the countries and the peoples have always been represented as these objects in these uh, geopolitical conquests. Never have we stopped and say, what is their reaction to all of this? Never have we asked to stop and say, what is their agency in all of this? And that's part and parcel of what we're saying with the other, the other type of research, which we are also uh, encouraging, is that greater appreciation of indigenous knowledge, indigenous ways, because for tens of thousands of years, this body of water and the people of Libya have thrived. They haven't been just objects of these geopolitical conquests. They have thrived. These players come and go, but the people and the cultures remain. And that's um, a, a fundamental truth that we need to unpack and continue to at least teach and research within our universities. That um, is a very powerful story, a very true story that needs to be carried on. Yeah. Mm. So something to start off with in that conversation. Mm. He knows a lot of history. He does. It's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm learning a lot right now. Likewise. <laughs> So in terms of accountability of the recipient country, that's a very interesting question. Um, is the recipient country obliged to be accountable for what it receives? Culturally, uh, in Samoa, if you receive a gift um, in the village or in a ceremony, a guy walks out and then broadcasts this what you received. Okay, family A has brought five pigs, 20 fine mats, and two plates of food there is uh, a natural kind of uh, transparency mechanism that is inbuilt into our culture. Um, not so much when it comes to international relations because the government, the fam the, our country is the family and we protect the family. Um, and so if China is giving us 20 million and the US is giving us 20 million, we have no obligation to send the, the, the tattooed boy out to shout out the, the numbers. We may skew the numbers or be vague about the numbers so we may, we may receive more, but that is also a strategy that occurs in the micro level, in the family level, so that families can naturally survive because you're you know, amassing resources. So I like to ask that question, is the recipient country obliged? Like, are you obligated to, to, you know, disclose or to be accountable for the funding that you're receiving? Because in the same vein, you are being given conditions for that assistance and countries are having to meet these conditions. So are you also then asking us to be very open about it? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's food for thought and having worked at policy level in Samoan governments, it's, it's definitely um, interesting to see from the inside uh, the perspective on that. It is a burden. Yes. And it's interesting to also talk about this idea of is there a hidden agenda when countries outside of the Pacific strive to give? And is, is there something that they need to be ha held accountable for? What do you think? I, I mean, realistically, aid and development is a tool of foreign policy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> countries in the Pacific are not naive to that. Uh, I'm very much uh, that thought. But it's also how countries in the Pacific, like every other country, react to that aid and development, that it is a part of that foreign policy tool. Um, I just had to go back to something that was um, in the last question about, it wasn't just um, uh, the legacy of um, minerals and extra extraction. It is also a legacy of nuclear testing, huh? that the Pacific was also um, a grounds for testing by the UK, um, by the French uh, and the US of nuclear testing in the Pacific. And that's very important. And it's also related to, I think, a lot of what's on your mind about AUKUS, all right? I just wanted to bring that before we forget that <laughs> the Pacific was a ground for nuclear testing. So it plays very heavily in the minds of leaders, in the minds of policymakers, and in the minds of youth. We should never underestimate the minds, um, the knowledge of youth that um, the Pacific has been that dumping ground for many of these uh, external players. And I wanted to highlight that before I forget that. 
Yeah, it's interesting because that actually touches on my next question around the lived experience of Pacific people and whether we take that into account when it comes to regional development. Does that occur? Do we genuinely sit there and ask our Pacific peoples and communities in the islands whether their lived experience informs the next steps associated with regionalism? I'll start with this one then. Go yeah. ahead. Okay. <laughs> The reason why I'll start with this is um, <coughs> this is the pragmatism when you take in indigenous lived experiences in policy. Because this development agenda that we have in the Pacific, just across the world, is a 30-year-old, 40-year-old uh, sustainable development model, which has been undertaken by governments. And over that 35 plus years, a lot of success, but many failures. Huh? You know, we hear the rhetoric of not fit for purpose. Uh, these practices are cut, uh, cookie cutters from other parts of the world in Bangladesh and Africa and transplanted in the Pacific. You know, models of economic growth do not go in line with the realities on the ground mm -hmm. and undermines cultures and ways of life and knowledge in the Pacific. Something that we've heard for the last 30, 40 years. So what's being practical, what's happening? All right, so the last 10 years, you know, the research has seen, and this is actual proof, that governments are now speaking out, are now speaking back. They're trying to take control of their agenda. Huh? Maybe not in a way of the full agenda, but in pockets. We're starting to, to find this. In the way of how they manage um, external um, donor agencies and how they operate in the Pacific. It's not perfect, but that's, a, that's a, an example of that. Part of it is what we now hear as the listening that Australia needs to do. Huh? That's part of that rhetoric of countries speaking out, but also friends of the Pacific in Australia speaking up that we need to do better. Huh? We need to be much more better in our work in, 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 in government. And we're now seeing indigenous knowledge starting to be incorporated in national policy. Huh? using the way that it brings communities together and stakeholders. It's not just, here's the white paper, putting in your ideas. They're incorporating Talanoa. They're incorporating in uh, their Talanga. They're incorporating their, their views and ways of how to conduct this. Where is this coming from? Because we're practicing that in universities through our research. These indigenous methods and protocols are now part of our university methods when we engage with Pacific communities whether it be in Samoa, in Fiji, or our Pacific communities here in Sydney and uh, in Auckland. These practices are used by our researchers. Our policy makers are starting to take that in. We see this, this new 2050 strategy, regionalism from the Pacific that we saw passed last year, speaks of people-centered development. Development that is informed by Pacific, that use specific practices from communities. It's not perfect but we're starting to see these pragmatic approaches, not just by speaking out and say, stop, this is not good, but then also providing some of these solutions. Again, I go back to what some, my favorite message, and I hopefully Safi, we need to do more. We need to, in our universities, in Samoa, in Fiji, and here in Australia, acknowledge that. Give us the resources for researchers to research that. Let us teach that to our secondary school, to our high school. Let us teach that to Canberra. That's something, you know, to our policy makers in Canberra. That's something we need to do much more better in, in that mm. result. Yeah. Mm. Again, you know, learning quite a <laughs> <laughs> Getting a free lecture. Okay, so my perspective is um, centered around my understanding of how my late mother, who was a high chief and an indigenous conservation leader, um, integrated her voice into uh, regional meetings and regional initiatives and global um, uh, international negotiations. And as an indigenous leader, as a high chief from her village, she found a way to be heard at the international stage. And that was through like a very persistent, persistent approach. And she was smart about doing it. But it didn't, so she was one of the, um, the indigenous leaders who was at the Rio Convention, which as you know, this was one of the first conventions that integrated indigenous people's knowledge into a UN convention. 
um, quite historical, and then from there, we had this uh, flow-on effect where indigenous communities and representatives were then considered part of the negotiations. Slow, but it's getting there. So in terms of like, how do you, as an indigenous person, say a farmer, a fisherman, or a chiefess, or a youth member from an outer village in Tuvalu, how do you integrate or be heard uh, at a, a regional meeting or through a, say, a gender initiative by the region. Almost impossible. Almost impossible. Because you need resources, you need understanding of systems on the ground, and then you need empowerment through your local governments, through your national governments who have your voice heard. It took Greta, a light-skinned youth ambassador, to be heard around the world because she had the resources, the support of her family, and she made herself known and stood her ground. There were many youth ambassadors across the Pacific, across Caribbean, across Africa, who had been doing equally, if not more, in terms of the you know, climate advocacy that we never have heard of because they didn't have the same resources, access, and support that Greta had. Um, so my mother, God bless her amazing soul, she went the NGO route, because the only way as a local can be, you know, can be heard in those spaces is to go through nonprofits, non-government organizations, and um, cohorts. Uh, and that is also not necessarily a route where you will be heard because even in national and regional and international spaces, NGOs run parallel to governments. They don't run as part of governments, which is why they're called NGOs. So there are pathways for indigenous people to be heard, but it's not easy pathways. Mm. Um, the best pathway is to work through their governments and integrate um, their priorities through national policy, say for instance, uh, national environment policy, being part of consultations locally, but it's not an easy pathway and it's not an easy way forward. And it sounds like education is key. So my last question before I hand it to yourselves to ask us some questions is this idea of how do we ensure that Pacific people in the diaspora that again living in places like New Zealand and Australia and in the US can proactively contribute to this shared conversation and influence in the region? If I may, because I'm not working in mainstream acad academic uh, environments right now. Um, I think it's really important for diaspora to acknowledge that they, um, that they, that we live outside of our spaces um, and that we don't speak for our people, um, but we speak about and we may derive the knowledge and reflect on our experiences, but we certainly don't speak for them. I think it's extremely valuable to have more brown voices in academic space, to, be, to have more of you and you, because it's only through those lenses can you truly influence the scholarship that comes out. Because often, how many times have I read Pacific studies by white Australians? by Americans, by Europeans. It's only up until maybe about 10 years ago where there are Pacific scientists who were quoted or who were referenced in climate um, journals. It's mostly been those outside of the Pacific. So I think how diaspora can, can influence is by honoring the voices of those in the ground, but also honoring your own lenses um, in integrating it into your research and how you can influence your colleagues where you are. Yeah, no, so the Pacific Diaspora are still representatives of their island heritage, but they're still doing it collectively mm -hmm. with our communities back home in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Um, my um, view of Pacific Diaspora and their contribution to the Pacific is something very optimistic, but I also feel there's not enough. Uh, mm. In terms of, I'll frame my views in terms of my, my sort of observation in Australia. And I'll start from this. I hope I see the day that I see a Samoa, uh, not a Samoa. 
A I hope I see the day I see a Pacific politician as a federal minister. All right. We need a lobby in Canberra. Sorry, I'm Canberra based, and so I'm expecting someone from you. It's wonderful to see Pacific leadership starting to grow across Australia. We have MPs from the Pacific, who are of Pacific heritage, Pacific descent, now in, in these spaces. It's important, but that shouldn't be the goal, uh, the only goal. It's refreshing to see the arts where our um, communities are now leading in and showcasing um, because um, not only in the arts, but also in the business. Because I see this is where we are able to sort of all achieve what we're trying to um, work through is greater awareness of the Pacific in Australia. And it comes from the whole diaspora. Right? Because part of uh, misconception of the Pacific is because diaspora don't have the platforms, enough platforms in Australia to represent and tell their stories, not only of the lived experiences here, but also how they are connected to home. Uh, we're starting to see that uh, governments like Australia are taking uh, an initiative to engage with Pacific Diaspora through business councils, uh, engagement with research centers like ours to do more research in the Pacific and of course in the diaspora. Um, in terms of opportunities for cultural exchange, but there needs to be more. Uh, and that's where um, uh, the diaspora comes through. Because a lot of the business, I, I see the potential of Samoan, Coco, and Taro owners selling within the markets here. It's starting, but it's not good. No, it's not as big as we want it to be. But I also see us selling Sydney-made um, Pacific t-shirts and sending them off to Samoa and then wearing because there is an economy that we haven't really see, uh, sort of explore the potential. All right? And so um, even the way that we look at diaspora tourism, you know, there was a, you know, people was like, how can we improve tourism? Part of that is also catering for the diaspora. So many of us are going back home for funerals, weddings, family reunions. Uh, the tourism market is catered to the family um, white um, tourists that comes in and spends their time at the resort, but nothing catered to us diaspora who come home with the thousands of dollars to pump back to the economy. So it's a back and forth. It's also breaking within uh, our communities the importance of diaspora to our communities but, and our, our countries back home, but also an onus to us here uh, to break, but also share the awareness about the Pacific here in Australia, but also breaking some of these um, ceilings that we have, uh, whether it be through political participation. It's fantastic that we are there in the arts and sports, but we need to do better in education and we need to do better in the politics in this country, because there's a lot that the diaspora can contribute here as well. Totally. I've been involved previously in supporting various initiatives with the diaspora, including an initiative called Pacifica Achievement to Higher Education. And that was all about being able to create vocational and career aspirations amongst Pacifica communities in Western Sydney. And our motto is, when one achieves, we all succeed. Amen. So it's this reciprocal <laughs> view, again, that we're talking about, the relationally driven, the, the holistic view of our communities, that we can also benefit here in the diaspora, in the islands, but also, it's a learning point for non-Pacific people to value mm. our holistic views mm. and potentially integrate such perspectives into Western modernity. We're now going to take questions from yourselves, but we are actually going to start with what's on the screen from our uh, audience live uh, streaming in. And uh, with Slido, what happens is that people are able to actually vote for questions that they like that, that, that appear. So whilst yourselves are deciding what questions you would like to ask our panel, please raise your hand and we've got a couple of roving mics. I'm gonna to go to our Slido and ask questions from here. So we've got a question that states, climate change is having a geographic impact on the Pacific. Question, how is this affecting their international relationships? I'll take this one. <laughs> so um, my PhD research was focused on 
the loss of statehood of islands. When an island disappears, what happens to their statehood? What happens to the identities of, of um, the nationalities of those who live? You know, um, do you s are you still a Tuvaluan if you don't have land to stand on? Under the UN conventions, if you don't have land, you cease to become a state. But Pacific Islanders, our identities go beyond the land we stand on. They were handed down through our ancestors, and basically our land is the ocean. Those are the spaces our ancestors occupied. So that's just a brief of my, of my uh, PhD, because it is relevant to this question, which is how is this affecting international relationships? Well, it's, it's a, a fundamental flaw in international relations right now through the international negotiations is that the powers are in the hands of those causing the most harm. Mm. And those who suffer first and worst will continue to beg and be at the mercy of those who continue to cause the most harm. And so that is the greatest injustice in international relations in terms of international climate law and international negotiations because the very existence of Pacific Island nations are at the hands of those who refuse to cooperate to um, to endorse uh, you know an ambitious climate goal to ensure that the problems that Pacific Islanders will continue to face um, you know are lessened and that it is addressed so this is how does it in fact, um, affect international relations in a very harmful way because Pacific Islands, you know, want to put their faith in the international community and promises are made to the Pacific Islands, but those promises are not being met. Mm -hmm. Okay, question from the floor. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi, Hi. Uh, my name is Mary. Um, I have a, um, just a question around Pacific influence. I. Uh, I think it's a really interesting component, especially um, as I think for the first time in a long time, the Pacific Islands has the focus of the global stage um, from a climate change perspective. And now <coughs> Australia is competing um, on a global level for investment resources and um, essentially the Pacific Islands can have a bit more authority in terms of positioning themselves. Um, what are your thoughts on how, how are we doing that? Um, I know that um, the discussion so far, I think, has um, kind of focused on the history, but I guess taking that important historical context, how do we use that and boost ourselves and take um, control of the momentum at the moment? Um, and this is just an, an add-on, but I think one other component that hasn't really been discussed is the role of the private sector in enabling these changes as well. So just your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, thank you. So <clears throat> in terms of, um, and I'm glad you asked this, I found I spoke too much on the lecture history and didn't go into the pregnant. So <laughs> where's the agency? And <laughs> <laughs> um, current discourse around security and the Pacific. So a lot of it is on this geopolitical conquest uh, of the Pacific and uh, maneuvering by US and China. But within that discussion, we see what I see, the cooperation of ideas. Uh, the Blue Pacific has come through, promoted by um, the Pacific Island Forum through uh, Dame Mick Taylor and the former Prime Minister of Australia, Lili Langoi. The idea of the Blue Pacific identity, that it's about ocean continents, large ocean states, um, it's about solidarity of countries, you know, coming together. So through that identity, they've been able to influence the Pacific agenda. One that is, when you're looking at security, it's not just about security of states, which is fundamentally important at, to all countries, but it's also about incorporating that view, human security, people security, and climate security. Now, we may think, oh, Everyone knows climate security, no, it's not accepted. Within the UN Security Council, climate security is something that is discussed within the, the forums, but there's no real action that comes through, all right? But what Pacific countries have been doing since 2007, pursuing this within the UN Security Council, pursuing this within regional security, 
through declarations like the bold declarations, countries, greater powers are now saying, oh, if we want to engage with the Pacific on security, we need to also engage them on climate security. And so now we have the partners of the Blue Pacific Alliance, led by United States, Australia, and UK. Part of that, they said, we are also going to work with the Pacific on climate security. This is important because all other countries around the world are now looking at this is the group of countries that are pursuing this, hopefully a norm that comes through that says we need to engage in debates, but also solutions as well as um, uh, you know, more areas that revolve around climate security. Because so far, climate change is seen as an economic in terms of mitigation or the work that we respond to it through adaptation. And of course, injustices in terms of loss and damage, but we've never viewed it in terms of security. How does that become part and parcel, not just of an academic exercise, but also a policy discourse? Uh, and so that's one contribution, is that through this avenue of pursuing your, um, an identity of Blue Pacific, which comes from Pacific Way, you're also pursuing these pragmatic approaches into setting agenda around climate security. That does not just benefit displacement or the movement of fish in the Pacific or some form of uh, seawater inundation. This is for the rest of the world. Uh, this is for understanding and unpacking climate security, how it impacts in, in Africa or in the Middle East. That's something that's uh, where these, not, not just small countries, the large ocean states are pursuing. So a lot of what's happening in the Pacific can be applied more broadly as part, again, of a shared global conversation. Let's take another question on Slido, and then there are some questions over here. So let me just take this question from Dr. Tess newton Kane. Hi, Tess. The question is, does the most recent AUKUS decision make the Pacific Islands region more or less secure? Oh. A lot of money, a lot of time um. and energy being put into this at the moment. <laughs> yes, I mean, um, AUKUS. Uh, as we know, yesterday, it's going to be a 30, 40 year plan, and that's what was unpacked. You can look at it from many different ways. Deterrence, having such type of technology in the Pacific will bring about some form of peace. But at the same time, we also need to acknowledge that there is a lived experience. And we just saw uh, two weeks ago in the streets of Suba, students of USB, as well as um, staff from around public organization, um, offices and we're demonstrating about uh, nuclear free, you know? So it is a lived experience. It's something that will inform the decisions of the countries. Um, will this make the region more or less secure? Only time will tell. And that's something that IRs always say. Only time, <laughs> will, only time will tell. But it's important that um, as uh, we get to know more and more about this um, uh, AUKUS, um, is that we're also taking on these perspectives. Part of it is that this lived experience of what um, uh, uh, countries, but also um, leaders will be saying about this. Yeah, fantastic. Langi, did you want to add to that? No, I'll take okay. a question from the floor. Okay, awesome. Our next question. Um, Sala Langi Ajioji, Maloe Taulawaki Hepooni. Um, my name is Sala, and as a Tongan, firstly, I want to say that it's been lovely hearing this Talanoa. Um, Sala, earlier you mentioned that uh, you talked about the privileging or the prioritising of Western knowledges or the smart word um, epistemology and ontology. <laughs> and Lang, you said um, that our ancestors um, unfortunately had to surrender to that and still today a lot of our people um, often internalise um, that that is better and that we still discard a lot of our traditional knowledges. Um, so I just wanted to ask um, in our collective mission to decolonise, um, how are you seeing um, people of our communities or more specifically um, the people in the villages that you serve or that you are uh, accountable to? How are you seeing the um, people there reclaiming our traditional knowledges? Mahalo, Sala. It's great to see you. And, um, you know, this is the thing. When I see a face like Sala's, I'm like Samoan or Tongan. So thank you for resolving that issue for me. <laughs> um, so, very important question there. I think first and foremost, in, in the villages, um, so I hold uh, three chiefly titles from three different village in, villages in Savai, which is, as I said to Georgie, the birthplace of Oceania. <laughs> it's called Savai, my <laughs> island, FYI. Um, and so, it's important to note that 
uh, those who still live in the villages, um, our families and our communities still hold true to the practices that they have. They never really let go. What was let go was like we surrendered certain things to Christianity. And so instead of doing other things on a Sunday, we now go to church twice a day. Instead of being topless, we now wear the pulitasi. Um, instead of men having long hair, men now have short hair. So there's all of these things that permeate the daily lives of Samoans and Tongans and, and others um, that we have now normalized. And so asking or looking at it um, or perceiving that as different in, in today's world is something that will take many, many years. And in fact, it's not needed, right? Because the systems that are there um, are working for our villages. I think what needs to change is more at a, at a national level to reclaim some of the practices that we have had in the past to instead of using a, um, a Coke bottle or a Sprite bottle for the traditional ceremony, that we go back to the coconut. Um, instead of using the ears, the, the fabrics that we buy from the Chinese stores, that we go back to the fine mats, to the woven mats. And so that requires interventions from a cultural ministry level, national level, to encourage people to restore those um, and yeah, restore the uh, arts and crafts and our traditional ways of life. But I, I want to add here, Salah, that it's not all bad that Christianity came in, that, that those guys got off the boats, right? Um, because in Samoa, we have traditional banishment um, rules in the village, and it's horrific. So there's several level, levels of banishment, if you and this is like um, natural justice within the village and chiefly system. If you commit a crime so severe upon the the reputation of your family and of your village, you can be stripped and then tied to a pole like a pig and burned. So, thank goodness for Christianity. <laughs> we were just discussing this a few nights ago with my sisters, where we're like, you know what? It's probably a good thing. So, you know, just keep in mind that there is there is a balance. There were things culturally that we are, I'm certainly grateful that we don't practice anymore. The vir virginity testing um, before the sala, I'm sure you'll be grateful that, you know, those methods are not practiced anymore. So I think it's it's good to see, to, to uh, appreciate that culture is still very strong within our villages. It's certainly been compromised due to Chris. Christianity and colonialism, but on the flip side, there are certainly some cultural practices that definitely needed that, that intervention. And we know that culture naturally evolves. Indeed. So that's something that we'll continue to lean into with view that we will reclaim, resist, and really celebrate our resilience as specific cultures as well. Oh yeah, um, my name is Loic, and previously you'd mentioned about indigenous knowledge and how they have recently been incorporated into policies. And I was just wondering how those policies, or and you gave some examples of those policies, and I was wondering how those policies affect Pacific influence. Great question, thank you. Sala. <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, so how does these, if we, such a big, you know, um, where to start from? Confidence. People have the confidence to express and articulate not their problems first, but their, where they can contribute. Uh, we tend to, the current development models encourages us to think of the problem, of the challenge. Mm -hmm. And that I feel continues on this cycle of solving, trying to solve problems rather than focusing on the success. And so what I'm trying to say is when through these practices and what we've seen and witnessed as uh, they've been incorporated into policy, into classrooms, people have the confidence 
to articulate what that is. But they also start from saying, well, I can contribute or the solution is in this. Uh, um, but it's also, a, thank you for asking that because it then is asking us to, as researchers, document that properly. Because we're only witnessing it because we're enthralled in what we're now designing and what we're now creating and um, trying to share with everyone by empowering them. But you're also asking us, how does that benefit our communities? And it's something that uh, I can only say from this quick observation of this confidence. So we've got time for 30 second answers to one quick question, <laughs> which is around this idea of indigenous knowledges from Australia. And I believe we can, if we are going to really privilege Pacific indigenous perspectives in the region, we really do need to also privilege <coughs> Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives here in Australia. Would you agree? Yes. 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 <laughs> I want I want to give you a 30 second answer on Please. this one. I've been working in the media reporting um, for local, regional and international media for 20 years. And there is a program by DFAT where they invite a journalist, a well-known journalist from Australia to come visit Samoa and chat to us. Not a single indigenous or Torres Strait Islander um, journalist has visited. And um, in my research on media, I have continuously asserted the fact that um, indigenous journalists in Australia share the same challenges that Pacific Island journalists have, which is uh, we, we share the same nuances in terms of covering our communities. There's about the same number of journalists, indigenous journalists in Australia as there are in the whole media in Samoa. There's not that many. So you have the, the challenge of like the numbers and then also resource constraints and then training, because you also need to be trained a certain way to cover your community. So I've always asserted that, um, just from a media perspective, that the Pacific media, sorry, Australian media can really benefit from learning from uh, indigenous journalists and having more. Mm, I completely agree. And then I think that would really reshape the conversation and the way in which Australia holds and uh, exercises influence in the region. Please join me in thanking Dr. George Carter and Dr. Langi Pueva Sherol Jackson. Thank you so much for your participation in tonight's panel. <laughs>Of course, I'd like to thank yourselves for being here and for those joining us via the live stream. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Sydney Ideas team, our AV and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Thank you for your support. For more upcoming talks or catch up on demand, visit Sydney Ideas website, sydney.edu.au forward slash sydney dash ideas. We really, really hope to see you at another Sydney Ideas event. I'm Chorchi Ravulo. I've been your host. Benakabakalevu, thank you and good night. Thank you again for thank coming. You.